Welcome to Revival Radio TV. We've recently been talking about historical people who chose to be the one as defenders of the faith. Now, as Christians, sometimes it falls to us to explain Christianity and God's ideas behind the plan of salvation, as well expose counterfeit ideas and explain why they are bad ideas. In this episode, it's fitting that we're talking about a man who used allegorical stories to tell epic truths about God. Remember, we've seen allegories used before by our favorite Puritan, John Bunyan, in his best all-time seller, Pilgrim's Progress. When we think about Christian revivals, we often picture people sitting in a tent or a church accepting Christ and praising God. That's good, but let me introduce you to an amazing Englishman who used books and radio to bring others to Christ, a man who truly chose to be the one in his generation, C.S. Lewis. I think what Lewis did that was so impactful is that he took theology and he crafted stories that made you connect with truth in a heart way. So maybe as a child, I couldn't grasp the idea of God becoming man, but I could grasp the idea of this glorious lion coming from the emperor over the sea to save some children and use those children to change the world. And just that idea brought the truth of God about destiny and calling and what Jesus did for us. It made it alive for me in a really, uh, in a way that I could understand it in a storytelling form. I think that's exactly what Jesus did with parables. He took the kingdom of God and he made it relevant. Uh, to people who just wanted to hear um, about God and, and truth, but needed it portrayed in a way they could understand it. And Lewis did that so well. I want to take you back uh, to Oxford, uh, just at the beginning of World War II. And um, Lewis now, uh, he's a very brilliant man and they recognize that. So he's now a fellow and he's teaching, he's a tutor of English literature at Oxford, at the great university. But the world is changing, it's, it's getting very dark again and Britain is at war. Now bombs were falling everywhere. Now they only found out after World War II that Hitler had, had directed his, all, his whole air force, don't bomb Oxford. Because when I take over that country, I want to make that my headquarters. So because the history of that city goes back to the Middle Ages, I mean, to universities that are hundreds and centuries of years old. So we're in World War II and the BBC, which was very Christianized at the time, had a head of religious broadcasting. They're looking for something. They want a voice of hope. There's darkness everywhere. The radio had just, I just taken off. People were buying these radio sets. My father, his mom, you know, had said to him, if you don't turn that radio off, I'll cut the cord. It was like television or internet or smartphones uh, today. The BBC wanted a voice and a Christian voice on that new medium. And Lewis said something very interesting. He's the academic, but he said this, that he accepted the, um, the invitation to do these broadcasts on religion, on apologetics, that's a, a big word, on defending the Christian faith, not because of expediency, but because of conscience. So even then we have a man who knows how to be led by the Holy Spirit. It was fascinating as a youth reading The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. It's hard to imagine my town losing entire blocks to bombs or having to send away our children for safety. Yet through CS, books, I could experience what it was like for the four children who were sent to the country for their safety. C.S. wrote from his personal experience since he safeguarded people in his home during the war as well. C.S. Lewis had a heart for his people. During the darkest days of World War II, the English people were feeling alone. Everything seemed to be falling apart. C.S. Lewis thought that what would encourage the people was reminding them that Jesus cared about them. Listen to him from a BBC broadcast. Everyone's heard of evolution, how men evolve from lower types of life. We Christians don't call it evolution. 
because we believe it isn't something coming up out of blind nature, but something coming down from the world of light and power and knowledge beyond all nature. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Look for Christ and you will get him and with him everything else thrown in. He was a complex man and you can hear that come through in his story. C.S. Lewis, he was an Irishman, and now today that would be called Northern Ireland. And he grew up in a wonderful home, but as a young boy, tragedy just, just visited his home. His mom died. He was, I think, six or seven years old, ripped from that loving home and the comfort, just where everything made sense to a young child. He was a very imaginative child. He had his own world. But he was all of a sudden just thrown into the real cold world with no support. Now, his father just didn't know how to handle the loss of his wife. And what they would do in those days was uh, they would send a young child, eight years old, to boarding school. So he would just visit home in vacations. After boarding school, it gets worse. He's thrown into the army trenches of World War I. We're in 1914. I remember uh, doing evangelism in my local town and coming across a World War I veteran who was 80 plus, and it was the 1980s, and he was an atheist. It had affected him. It not only affected the individual, it affected uh, the entire world and the nation. It was changed, it was different, it was darker after World War I. In those trenches, it was brutal. I mean, the unimaginable carnage was just on an industrial scale. Thousands died every day. It, it just destroyed a whole generation. Now, I grew up in very rural English village atmosphere, and every village has got a stone memorial to World War I. And, and as you visit these small, um, these small places, you're hit by the names. There's this name after name after name of all these young men who died. I mean, everyone suffered loss. No one was prepared. I mean, they just hadn't imagined. They thought the war was going to be over in just a few months. It was not like that at all. And yet, I mean, how it, how it often is, just 20 years later, that horror was repeated on an even grander scale. In a time where many families lost parents or siblings you would have asked advice from, C.S. Lewis used his books to catch those areas. He wasn't shy bridging Christianity to meet his nation's troubles head on, but healing the heartbreak of losing his mother, of being left seemingly abandoned in a school where his teacher would end up insane, that kind of thing isn't usually fixed in a microwave moment. You know, the fascinating thing about C.S. Lewis is that he was this in incredible teacher and had all of this knowledge, but he was also very a hu human person. And I think it's partially the humanness that helps us to connect with him. Myself as an artist, uh, I was amazed by his parables and his storytelling ability. And it moved me to think, wow, what kind of stories could I tell that might affect my generation? but he lost his faith in those trenches, in those desolate trenches of France and Flanders, as many, many, many young men did. Now, he had a good friend, his war buddy, um, in the trenches, and they made a pact, a compact, and they said to each other, if I die, I want you to take care of my mom. If you don't make it, I'll take care of your father. And in those days, your word was your bond. And, and guess what? Lewis, he survived the war, but his friend didn't. And he honored that. I mean, such a, such a thing. It changed his life. He honored that and his promise to his friend. So he took care of his friend's mother for the rest of his life. That was a big commitment, honoring the promise he made in war to take care of his friend's mom. Another person that had an impact on Lewis was G.K. Chesterton. He was an amazing defender of the faith, and through his writings, especially his book, The Everlasting Man, 
He became a mentor to Lewis and he set him on the path to accept Jesus as Lord. And he helped shape his understanding of what good Bible doctrine was. Here's an example. Chesterton used the Bible to critique Darwin's theory of evolution and Lewis continued the dialogue. Lewis's strong word-based foundation was used to weave and to create an allegory of the gospel in his fictional stories, just like the famous Puritan John Bunyan did in Pilgrim's Progress. Only this time, with Lewis's deep knowledge of medieval history, he set his stories in the realm of knights and castles to capture a generation's imagination and deliver the gospel message to millions. So I'm visiting Oxford, there's the colleges and the universities, but I had to visit the place where the Inklings met. Now the Inklings were C.S. Lewis and a group of friends who would discuss the books, their writings, and it's called The Eagle and the Child. I had a meal there and uh, it's hundreds and hundreds of years old and it's where they would meet to discuss what they were doing. Locally, it's known as the bird and the baby, which I just think is hilarious. Now, you have intellectual giants meeting around food and uh, they, they're the craftsmen of the day and the wonderfully you know, uh, gifted. Now, these guys made a difference for generations to come. So they would get together and Lewis would often say, well, has, has nobody got anything to read us? And they would start, and uh, now you may have heard of the Narnia stories, but the Lord of the Rings you've heard of. And the author was a, a gentleman called J.R.R. Tolkien, a good friend of Lewis. And it was Tolkien, he would bring each new chapter of his great writings, the Lord of the Rings, and hand them out week after week, and they'd read them. The Inklings was kind of a creative collective of, of different authors who came together and they all had their own ideas of how to write and different goals. But as they shared ideas, there was this synergy that occurred. And, and some of those people wrote amazing stories that we're all familiar with now today. In every awakening, you see new converts coming to Jesus. You see a mentoring process taking place that teaches the good news. Remember, mentoring is the same thing Jesus did, only we call it discipleship. Lewis was unsaved when he began attending the Inklings meetings. He didn't even believe in God. He was on a path from atheism to becoming a disciple of Jesus. But these discussions would lead Lewis away from from atheism. I mean, atheism had gripped the whole nation because the church became a, an establishment and he um, started that journey home. And he said of this, he said, what I owe to that group is incalculable. Uh, he would find Christ, he would accept Christ. And he asked this, he said, is any pleasure on earth as great as a circle of Christian friends by a good fire. Lewis went from atheism to being born again. What a journey C.S. Lewis and his Christian friends had. What do you think was the crucial point where Lewis realized he needed to accept Christ? And what does a myth have to do with it all? C.S. Lewis once asked Tolkien a very interesting question. And it's a very good point. He said, there are myths in all these cultures Lewis was an expert on the, all the ancient Roman and Greek cultures and heritages. He said, there's myths in all of them. Isn't Jesus a myth too? I mean, I thought that when I was on my way, you know, to the Lord. Now, and Tolkien said something which is so interesting. Now today it's a little different. He said, yes, it is a myth, but it isn't. I'll explain that. Now today the word myth is like fake news. We get a lot of fake news, but that was a difference meaning in the original understanding of that word in early history. Lewis said this, and it's so, so good. He said, now the story of Christ is simply a true myth. It's like a myth working in the same way as the others, but a tremendous difference. This really happened. It's not an exaggeration. The stories of Jesus are not an exaggeration. C.S. Lewis found Jesus 
And just like the Lord comforted and healed him, Lewis would take up the banner to love and care for his beloved readers and his radio audience. It was a time like now where each person had to step up. Lewis was a voice for his generation. C.S. Lewis could see the world was headed in a bad direction as nations like Germany and Russian communists were using things like social Darwinism and survival of the fittest to justify their utopian social engineering. Very shortly, it would show up as re-education camps, medical testing, wild experimentation, no human compassion to see. Instead, it would be directed to whoever didn't have the power to refuse it. In the face of this heartless plan for a nation, C.S. Lewis compassionately reached out. His discussion of evolution and Christianity was amazing. C.S. Lewis said it so well, get him, get Jesus, and we get everything else added. The creator of science gave us amazing things to explore and experience. As we explore history too, it's easy to see that real science confers genuine knowledge to humanity. C.S. Lewis also wrote a book called The Magician's Twin that was a dystopian story of how scientism, which is not science, was being used by ideological scientists to run roughshod over the rights of man. They did this to gain power and forcibly spread their rule unquestioned by the masses. Scientism in the name of science. Well, the idea was the experts knew what was best, right? Amidst the backdrop of wars, who would notice one more distraction as they work to take away your right to make decisions for you and your household? It becomes a slippery slope when you just let the nation's leaders figure out who lives and who does not. As you read C.S. Lewis's book, he is so honest. He lit up discussions with comments like, if the scientists themselves cannot arrest the Darwinian process before it reaches the common reason and kills that too, then someone else must arrest it. He was fearless, exploring the fallacies of Darwinism and accurately pointing out the truth that we have now seen documented. One thing that Lewis did was he pulled the gold from some of the ancient myths and legends from different cultures. So for instance, Greek mythology, he would pull specific things from there and then use it to tell a grand story. And it's something that his British audience would be very well versed in because they all studied these things. And to hear it with a new twist was something that really resonated. For instance, his book, Till We Have Faces, fascinating tale. In fact, it's one of my favorite Lewis books because it, he, he drives at the heart of humanity and he turned it around to communicate Christ. So he was very, very strategic in the way that he pulled from history and then used stuff that people were familiar with in order to communicate the gospel. C.S. Lewis wrote 30 books and many other writings. He looked at his generation and found creative ways to bring the gospel to people right where they lived. It was such a joy uh, to visit the humble home of C.S. Lewis. I was in Oxford just a couple of years ago. I, I was preaching. I had to go there. You have to make an appointment to visit the house. And uh, it was such a joy to, to visit a very humble home. It, it was not like a great palace in contrast to the ancestral home of Winston Churchill, which is just a few miles out of, of Oxford, is called Blenheim Palace. It's a palace, seven acres under roof. And this very simple professor, Oxford home, not fancy in any way, but a beautiful um, restored house. It's been brought back to its 1950s, 1960s look and feel. It was great to be there. and. Um, I remember they were filming that day. They were doing a video. There's a lot of activity around that house all the time. And so I had to go somewhere. So I went to the kitchen and it was just like it was in the early photographs of the 1950s. And I had to have a cup of tea, a British cup of tea. Lewis drank gallons of that stuff, <laughs> I think, to keep him awake. And I just felt very at home and very connected. It's though I was back in the 1950s and Lewis could just walk in any moment. You know, the remarkable thing about Lewis is that he was not a theologian. He was actually a, what they call a medievalist. He taught 
uh, medieval literature. And he was immersed in mythology and all of this uh, history that made that worked for his British audience because they understood all the backdrop. And then he pulled from that and he crafted, crafted amazing stories that had castles and knights and emperors. You know, in Acts 17, the Apostle Paul used the same legends to tell the people of Athens why they wanted Christ. That Christian revival birthed an Athens church. I never wanted this Chronicle series to end. It should go on forever. Lewis was writing this to inspire us, but also to tell the story of creation which Darwin had attacked with Darwinism. In the first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we see the beauty of creation and hints of intelligent design. We see how evil entered in, but wasn't subdued like Adam and Eve were told to do to sin in Genesis 1.28. We experience through the life of the lion what Jesus did for us and what he won us. In the next book with Prince Caspian, you see the creation of the early church. Here's the Apostle Paul, who's a Revelation 1-6 king, just like Prince Caspian is supposed to be. But pagans are trying to keep him from his rightful place. You can almost see Paul walking down the streets of Ephesus, getting help from his fellow ministers and their feisty eagerness to not only be rightful kings by faith, but expand the kingdom of God, share the Great Commission, share good news. Lewis depicts an era where if there was a problem, they went after solutions. I actually found a fascinating piece of evidence that tells us where his heart really was. I was in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and I went to the C.S. Lewis Square. Now, Lewis was actually born in Northern Ireland in Belfast. He was not born in England, like some people think. He was born in, in Belfast. And they have, as tribute to him, they have statues, they have lions, they have all sorts of cool stuff that you can go and investigate. And in what they call the C.S. Lewis Square, in downtown Belfast, there's actually a plaza that has a statue of a man walking into a wardrobe and just opening up the door and peering inside. And of course, we all know that's tribute to the line, the witch in the wardrobe and how Lucy entered the wardrobe and stepped into Narnia the very first time. On the back of the wardrobe, there's an inscription. And if we read this inscription, it's a letter from Lewis in 1961 to one of his young readers that actually gives us some background and clarifies where his heart was when he was writing the Chronicles of Narnia and these great stories that we love. And he says, Dear Anne, what Aslan meant when he said he had died is in one sense plain enough. Read the earlier book in this series called The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and you will find the full story of how he was killed by the white witch and came to life again. When you have read that, I think you will probably see that there is a deeper meaning behind it. The whole Narnian story is about Christ. That is to say, I ask myself, supposing that there really was a world like Narnia and supposing it had, like our world, gone wrong and supposing Christ wanted to go into that world and save it as he did ours, what might have happened? The stories are my answers. Since Narnia is a world of talking beasts, I thought he would become a talking beast there as he became a man here. I pictured him becoming a lion because A, the lion is supposed to be the king of the beasts. B, Christ is called the Lion of Judah in the Bible. C, I'd been having strange dreams about lions when I began writing the work. The whole series works out like this. The magician's nephew tells of the creation and how evil entered into Narnia. The lion, the witch in the wardrobe, is the crucifixion and resurrection. Prince Caspian, restoration of the true religion after corruption. The horse and his boy, the calling and conversion of a heathen. The voyage of the dawn treader, the spiritual life, especially in Reepicheep. The silver chair, the continued war against the powers of darkness. The last battle, the coming of the Antichrist, the ape, the end of the world and the last judgment. And he ends the letter, all clear, yours, C.S. Lewis. And I loved that because it told me that the heart behind his writing was very clearly more than just good stories, but really meant to reflect a Christian worldview and the heart of the gospel message.
Another thing about Lewis that's so fascinating is that he pulled from his understanding of, of Celtic history and early Irish, uh, even the early Irish saints, to help craft some of his characters. For instance, uh, back in, in early Ireland, they had lots of tribes, and so they would have had many kings, but they had one high king. And so it played into this understanding of, even in the Chronicles of Narnia, you have the, the four children who became kings and queens, but there was one high king. And then of course you have Aslan, who's the king of them all. And so I just love how, how Lewis shows us how we can pull from culture and even many different cultures to craft great stories that impact people on so many different levels. I think about our generation. What creative ideas does God have for us right now? Also, if you travel around Ireland and talk to people, they'll tell you which places inspired the backdrop of, of Narnia. And so like you can go visit this one castle that's on a little peninsula and it's all in ruins in Northern Ireland and actually walk up to it and have this moment of, oh, maybe I'm actually standing in the place that inspired Care Paravel, you know, and have these little moments where you can actually connect with the history. And, and it also makes me think, wow, what are the places in my history and that I've had places of beauty or experiences of wonder that I can pull from in order to craft and tell great stories, which as a filmmaker, I love to do that. Think about it. Lewis stepped up to be the one. What would you do if you felt the call to be the one like Lewis did? No matter where you start, be the one and build your dreams. Keep calm and carry on. And just like Lewis did, seize the moment and make it count for Christ today. It's true. Be the one. This really is only an introduction to C.S. Lewis. He had the courage to write his book, Miracles, when that wasn't very popular. An apologist going head to head against Darwin. From kids to adults, he always had time for his readers and his friends. In fact, during World War II's darkest days, he rallied a nation via BBC broadcasts. He crafted the Narnia books, an allegory full of parables, which continue to this day, inspiring movies and books. You know what happened in C.S. Lewis's time is happening again in our time. And it's fallen to us to step up and be the one in this generation.